17 year old. Congratulations. The moment when a Japanese blended malt whiskey was selected as the world's best. A stunning achievement. But in fact, over the past 10 years or so, premium Japanese whiskies have won top prizes almost every year. As a result, more and more people around the world have become fans of Japanese whiskey. You drink it cut with a little cold water and its aroma blossoms. Japan is halfway around the globe from the world's traditional whiskey making centers. But for a century, whiskey has been made in Japan, with Japanese drinkers in mind. This time on Japanology Plus, our topic is whiskey. We'll explore how Japan's relatively young whiskey industry has made such rapid strides. Hello and welcome to Japanology Plus. I'm Peter Barakan. I'm in Hokkaido, the northernmost of Japan's four main islands. This is Yoichi, a town of 20,000, about an hour's train ride out of Sapporo. Yoichi is home to the distillery of one of Japan's leading whiskey makers. And when you think of whiskey, you automatically go Scotland and probably Ireland, possibly America and even Canada. But recently, the world has started to take notice of Japanese whiskey too, and on today's program, we're going to find out why. It was the early 1920s when commercial distillation of whiskey began in Japan. It was an era of rapid westernization, and the quest to make an authentic Japanese whiskey was in tune with the times. Two men were instrumental in bringing whiskey making to Japan. Shinjiro Tori and Masataka Taketsuru. In 1899, Tori established a company to make and sell wine. His aim was to offer Japanese consumers alcoholic drinks that would measure up to Western originals. Later, Tori joined forces with a man who had studied whiskey at the source in Scotland. Masataka Taketsuru had learned the ropes in Campbelltown. He had compiled two notebooks full of information about whiskey making. These later became key manuals for whiskey production in Japan. In 1923, Tori, with the expert assistance of Taketsuru, built Japan's first malt whiskey distillery at Yamazaki between Kyoto and Osaka. Japanese whiskey making began with efforts to recreate Scotch whiskey. In 1929, a Japanese whiskey comparable to an imported one was launched. But first-time Japanese drinkers were not impressed with the trademark smokiness of Scotch. So, Tori set to work improving the raw distilled spirits and their blending, seeking to create a whiskey tailored to Japanese preferences. Taketsuru, meanwhile, was determined to stay true to the original flavor of scotch, and he ended up building his own distillery in Yoichi, Hokkaido. This set the stage for a rivalry between Tori and Taketsuru to make Japan's finest whiskey, a rivalry that ended up creating Japan's top two whiskey makers. Whiskey drinking itself evolved in new ways in Japan. People would drink whiskey with their meals, like beer or wine. For a better balance, the whiskey would be diluted with club soda, cold water, or even hot water. In this way, a new set of customs began to emerge around a drink that had been introduced from abroad. Our guest on this edition of Japanology Plus is Mamoru Tsuchiya, the editor-in-chief of the first magazine in Japan that was devoted entirely to whiskey. There are now about a dozen whiskey distilleries in Japan, and we are going to visit the one in Yoichi, a town in Japan's northernmost main island, Hokkaido. So 
So this is the distillery gate. Let's go on in. Taketsuru-san, the founder of this place, why did he choose Yoichi as a place to, to build his distillery? He searched around Japan for a place with a similar geography and climate to Scotland, and he felt that Yoichi was the best fit. One reason is that whiskey making requires a lot of fresh water, and a river called the Yoichigawa runs behind the distillery. Like Scotland's rivers, it is a peat river. They used to have wetlands around here. So, there is an ample supply of water and also plenty of the peat needed for drying the malt. Scotland has a, a cold climate, of course, like Hokkaido, but uh, as you can see, it snows a lot here and that's not the case in Scotland. Does that make a big difference? Yoichi probably has colder winters, and the average summer temperature in Yoichi is higher than Scotland's. That results in whiskey that matures more dynamically in the barrel here than in Scotland. But the key thing is that the weather remains at least cool all through the year and maintains a certain stable humidity. Whiskey is made by distilling a mash of barley or other grains that have been fermented in water. The raw distilled spirit is originally colorless, but when aged in wooden casks for as long as 30 years or more, it acquires the amber hue of whiskey. First of all, Tsuchiya takes Peter to see the stills. This is the still building. This is where the distilling is done. Oh. Hello. Hello. Mind if we look around? You're using coal to fire the stills. Is that a normal thing in distilleries? This is the only coal-fired distillery in the world. Only here in Yoichi do they use coal. Everywhere else it's become standard to use more efficient forms of steam for heating. So why keep on using it? Coal gives a hot fire which produces a raw spirit with more punch. That's why we stick with coal. Burning coal produces a hot flame, so the temperature at the bottom of the still is 1000 to 1200 degrees Celsius. That imparts a very strong flavor, and that is why they use coal. So it does actually affect the taste as well? That's right. Oh. What are the most difficult aspects of using coal? The toughest part is regulating the flame. It's not good for it to be too strong or too weak. So constant checking and adjustment is required. Coal is a very tricky fuel to work with. It requires a great deal of technical expertise and also years of experience. Now this is what is known as new make, the raw spirit. That's whiskey. Yes. When first distilled, it's always colorless. Oh, really? I had no idea. Wow. But this can't be called whiskey yet. To be whiskey, it must be aged in barrels. Then it will take on an amber color and become whiskey. At this stage, it's just raw spirit. Okay. Can I have a smell? Just to see. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh. That's quite a nice smell, actually. Very nice. Yeah. Oh. Next, Tsuchiya takes Peter to a warehouse for aging whiskey. This is the warehouse where the new make spirit you just had a whiff of is aged in casks. The distillery here in Yoichi has many of these warehouses. Right now, the distillery's chief blender, Tadashi Sakuma, is taking samples. Nice to see you again. Hello. Thank you for letting us in here. I'm starting to get drunk just on the, the smell of being in here. <laughs> the raw spirit is 63.5% alcohol. That's correct, yes. In the new casks that we manufacture ourselves, 
So you have new barrels and old barrels. Mm. What, what's the difference there with, with regards to making whiskey? Basically, new casks have a high content of the chemicals found in the wood. So when the spirit is aged in them, it absorbs a lot of woody aroma and flavor. As casks are used repeatedly, they give off less and less of those chemicals. So aging in a cask for the first time and the third time has different results. And different types of casks, like like sherry casks impart different aromas to the whiskey. Are there any major differences in the way that whiskey is made in Japan and mm. other countries? I think I can answer that one. In Scotland, there are around 100 distilleries like this. Japan has far fewer. And those 100 or so Scottish distilleries, even though they are rival companies, trade raw spirit among themselves. That is how they make blended Scotch whiskey. And the more variations of raw spirit they have to work with, the more stable the resulting flavor profile. But in Japan, there are very few distilleries, and they don't have a system for trading raw spirit among themselves. So Japan has a unique system in which a single distillery produces multiple different raw spirits. You won't find that in Scotland. Now, it's easier said than done for one distillery to produce multiple types of raw spirit. It takes a great deal of technical expertise, and that expertise isn't developed overnight. It takes a long time. That's a remarkable thing about Japanese distilleries. They've been creating differentiated spirits for many years, and now they are very proficient at it. It's a really striking feature. Broadly speaking, whiskey falls into three types. Malt whiskey is made solely from malted barley. Grain whiskey is made from corn or other grains. And blended whiskey is a combination of malt whiskey and grain whiskey. Among these three, blended whiskey is the most widely consumed around the world. One key factor contributing to the great global reputation of Japanese whiskey is the quality of its blenders. They offer top-class expertise. A blender is a specialist who creates the ideal whiskey by combining dozens of different raw spirits aged in different casks. Blenders thus play a crucial role in creating a company's identity. Japan's first whiskey distillery was built here in Yamazaki. What can we learn about the art of whiskey blending here? Seiichi Koshimizu became an industry legend as Yamazaki's chief blender. A number of his whiskies were acclaimed as the best in the world. His success rested on expert use of every sense not just taste and smell, and also an unbreakable routine. Temper udon. Yes, please. Every day for lunch, he would eat tempura udon, because eating something different would change how his taste buds behaved. He also gargled again and again each day to ward off colds. Some years ago, Koshimizu was asked to create a new blend. This one would be a whiskey aged 25 years, the world's premier class, selling for more than 100,000 yen a bottle in Japan. He also... A whiskey aged 25 years means that the youngest cask included in the blend is at least 25 years old. Koshimizu was entrusted with casks of whiskey stored for decades by the distillery. He started looking for characteristics that differentiated each spirit as it matured over time. First, he took samples of almost 300 different whiskies from the casks to determine which would go into the blend. Hmm, not much character. This might not work. I don't think this one will fit either. Having assessed the characteristics of each spirit, he formed an image of the blend he was aiming for. 
he narrowed down the candidate's spirits to 70 from 300. Then he started thinking seriously about the balance of characteristics. He decided the key element would be a smoky nose. So he emphasized smoky spirits in the blend and got down to work. What's this top note I'm getting? I don't have a good feeling about this. Maybe it comes from the immaturity in number three. Number three had a good smoky aroma, but was still somewhat immature. It retained a scent of the original grain. Ultimately, he decided it was not worthy of inclusion in a super premium whiskey. To find an alternative to number three, Koshimizu started re-evaluating all 300 spirits. He was looking for one that had the necessary strength of character to contribute to a whiskey aged 25 years. The way I always feel about blending is that there's no such thing as a perfect 100. That's to leave myself room to improve, I suppose. There's always room for improvement. After a year and a half of work, this is the whiskey that the distillery put on sale. One born from the total dedication of a master whiskey blender. Since then, Koshimizu has passed on the task of blending to the next generation. Nowadays, he travels around the country giving lectures to win more fans of whiskey. Today in Yoichi, Peter has a chance to see a blender's work firsthand. Today we have five types of spirit from different casks, different yeasts, different applications of peat, and so on. And also one that's totally different from a malt whiskey, a grain whiskey. So, six spirits in all. First of all, here's a malt whiskey from a sherry cask. Oh. Yes, that's quite a strong aroma. I think you'll notice hints of raisin and other dried fruits in the aroma. Are you getting that? Yeah, there's a kind of sweetness to it, uh, but it's, it's strong but sweet, yeah. And th there is a fruity sort of tang to it as well, yeah. So shall we... Yes, I'm going to blend up a nice basic whiskey with a good balance. So here we go. Hi. We can see how much of each you used. Uh, yes, I'm aiming for a total quantity of 10 milliliters. So how many milliliters of that? About half a milliliter. Uh, Only half? Wow! And quite a bit of that one. Ah, uh, so you add a lot, quite a lot of the grain. Oh, it's interesting. I'm aiming for a basic, typical sort of blended whiskey flavor. That's the kind of combination I'm looking for. How's that? This is exciting. Oh. Yeah, it's kind of sweet and fruity and smoky and... <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, yes, yeah. there is a balance of different flavor elements that is just right. Mm. By blending six different aromas, you get something completely different. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. Oh, that's really... Yeah. That's what's so fascinating about blending. Uh, I didn't realize that just smelling a drink without actually bringing it up to your lips could be so much fun. <laughs> Hi, I'm Matt Alt. So, how do you like your whiskey? Straight up? On the rocks? 
Well, right now, we're going to go to a Japanese bar that specializes in making traditional cocktails with a Japanese twist. This cozy basement bar is home to some of the city's top mixology, and it's run by Mr. Hidetsugu Ueno. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. Welcome. Thank you. So, can you tell me, uh, what are some of the ways that Japanese people like to enjoy their whiskey? For a long time, Japan has had its own unique style of drinking whiskey. Can you show that to me? I'd love to. I'll demonstrate one by one. First, a whiskey highball. Whiskey mixed with club soda. But you don't want the soda to be frothy. Regular on the rocks is too strong for Japanese drinking tastes. So, if you dilute the whiskey one to one with cold water and then serve it over ice, you get a half on the rocks. That's become popular in Japan in recent years. It's a very Japanese way to drink whiskey. Next, if you pour hot water into the whiskey, just the right amount, you get a hot whiskey and water. <laughs> but what about on the rocks? How about just whiskey on the rocks? Japan has hot and humid summers. My customers enjoy having whiskey on the rocks with a sphere of ice. It's very popular. Let me demonstrate for you. Right now. Oh, it carves so easily, so smoothly. Yes, you, you just keep cutting off corners and it gets rounder and rounder. By carving up a nice sphere on the spot for each customer, it makes the drink taste better. That's what I think, at least. I could watch this all day. This is, this is beautiful, beautiful work. How does that look? Wow. Beautiful. It really, it's like a diamond or something. <laughs> now watch as I pour the whiskey over it. Watch the ice float up as the liquid goes in. So beautiful. Now please enjoy. Just look at how that catches the light. This really is like a jewel in a whiskey glass. Well, this is certainly beautiful, but is there a reason why you carve the ice into a perfect sphere like this? Ice cubes melt from the corners, they say. So the idea is to eliminate all the corners. That way, you minimize the melting and dilution while still cooling the drink. That's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to improve the cooling effect. Better living through science. It works. I could stay here all evening, but while I'm still sober, uh, I have a request. Can you show me how to make an ice cube like this? I'm sure you'd like to jump right in and try it how I did it. But carving ice with a knife is not for beginners. So, hold it in this cloth and use this ice pick instead. Let's see how it goes. Okay. Ideally, you should try to just remove the corners evenly like I did. Here we go. The corners. Like this. Not towards your fingers. Like this. No, not like this, like this. Right. Wish me luck. Oh, oh okay. Oh, the, the ice is really flying. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> that was scary. That was really scary. As it gets rounder, it can slip more easily, so watch out. And the ice is melting away all the time. I see. The point here is to finish it before the body heat from your hand melts the ice down smaller. Just a little heat is fine. Oh, ah! <laughs> I'm sorry. I was, I'm, I'm sorry. That was, that was really bad. <laughs> I'm sorry. Now, fortunately, there's another way of making perfectly round ice cubes, or ice spheres, I guess you'd call them. This device. 
It's made here in Japan, and it uses a heated two pieces of metal here that you heat by soaking them in hot water, and then you put the ice cube in the middle and let the weight sculpt the ice into a perfect ball. Let's take the top off. Oh, look at that. Much nicer than the one that I just carved. This is perfect. Well, that was fun. Not often I get to drink on the job like that. One of the really cool things about a cocktail bar like this is seeing all the craftsmanship that the Japanese bartenders put into their creations. Next time you come to Japan, even if you don't drink, you might find it interesting to check out. Until then, see you next time. We have these extremely neatly written notebooks here. Yes, Masataka Taketsuru, who founded this facility in Yoichi, wrote these notebooks at a distillery called Hazelburn in Campbelltown, Scotland. He trained there for three months in 1920. Well, since he wrote these, it's been almost a hundred years. Yes. Getting on for it, if that was 1920. Yes. That Japanese whiskey is really recognized now around the world. Where does it go from here? Japanese whiskey is continuing to be made at full capacity. So we will probably see new developments in the Japanese whiskey scene. I think we may see the emergence of smaller craft distilleries and a new breed of whiskey makers. More people are getting involved. Four or five new distilleries have already started up. We've seen quite an increase in craft beer over the last few years. Can, can we expect to see the same kind of thing then with whiskey? Well, when you brew beer, you can sell the product immediately. With whiskey, though, it takes almost 10 years. What's interesting about whiskey is that it's like a human being. Think of the way it grows and changes over time. It changes over the period of time it spends in the cask. It's like a human life. Taketsuru made many whiskies that he was not able to drink in his lifetime. And those making whiskey right now may not be able to taste the fruit of their labor until 10 or 20 years from now, in their retirement years. So the way that whiskey involves passing things on to the next generation of technicians, of craft workers, is really fascinating. Okay, well, cheers to the future. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers to the future. Bye. Cheers. <laughs> this is good. Next time, our theme is the quest for perfect skin. Many Japanese women pursue an ideal...